church, and good morning. Welcome to another Sunday morning service. Uh, we are continuing on from last week when we started. We started um, with the book of John, and just uh, highly last week, uh, we did an introduction to the book of John, and my emphasis last week was the word. Uh, we're trying to break down more definition of what the word is. So basically, if I have a thought, you don't know that thought unless I express it. And basically, the word in John was the, ex the we know the word is God, and the word was the expression of God put into action through the body of Jesus. So uh, we define a little, uh, like I said, uh, the word. And now we're going to continue on where we left off last week. Uh, we're still in John 1, and we're continuing in uh, verse 14. So we talked about the word. So how is the word now expressed? Oh, sorry. This would, this would help. So we talked about the word. So now the word, we're going to continue on and see that the word is now expressed through the body of Jesus. Jesus is the word incarnate or the word made manifest that we could see. So this, the word is God's expression or God's thought uh, uh, made available or made uh, available through the body of Jesus. So, so um, like I said, so each section that we go through, I break it down, um, what we're going to talk about. So, so through 14 and 18, we're going to talk about Jesus' incarnation. That is, the Word became flesh. Uh, the, the Jesus' earthly sojourn, um, he, that was uh, the Word or tabernacled, God embodied, tabernacled, or uh, living among us. Jesus' essential glory, as over the, over the only begotten means he, the, uh, the word had a beginning, or the flesh had a beginning. Jesus' supreme excellency, uh, he is preferred before. We're going to break all this down. Jesus' divine, uh, divine sufficiency, his fullness, and Jesus' moral perfections, his grace and truth. So we're going to break all these down. And the last one, Jesus' wondrous revelation made known the Father. I want to thank Stevie for his tricks of the trade here. It makes it easier for me to go through. So Jesus is the Word incarnate, or the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh, or the Word became flesh. And the Word was made flesh, or and the Word was made or became flesh and dwelt among us. So what is the saying? That the infinite, or remember God is a spirit, he needs to manifest himself somehow in a body. So the infinite God, being unlimited, became finite or limited within a human body. And, and just in a basic term. So the invisible became tangible. So that which was beyond the reach of human mind became that which could be appreciated within the realm of human life. Here we are uh, permitted to see through a veil. So we talk about the veil. Remember the uh, tabernacle that Brother Greg talked about, the veil? Uh, you had the tabernacle, and behind the veil was the presence of the Shekinah glory of God. So we're now we're permitted to see beyond that veil, unveiled, so that which would normally have blinded us. Now the Word has become flesh, or made manifested. So He became what He was not previously. He did not cease to be God, but He became man. So how do we have a scripture to prove that? First Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. A lot of churches talk, oh, God's, you know, he's, he's a mystery. You can't explain God. Well, the scripture right here, it says, the mystery of godliness. What is it? God manifests in the flesh. That's a revelation. A lot of people don't see it until we give them a Bible study. So basically, as the word, then, he's the son of God. But as God manifested in the body, the flesh, he is the God-man. And we see that in his humanity, in a body, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. So God manifested in the flesh. As it was a union of two natures in the person of Jesus. It was necessary uh, to fit him for the office of being our future mediator. There's uh, three great ends were accomplished by God becoming incarnate or the word becoming flesh. So by God living in a body, now it was possible for him to die. Why was that? Because uh, Brother Greg previously talked about that, the tabernacle plan. 
You know, uh, we talked about that Wednesday, a couple Wednesdays ago, or a few a while back. Um, sin and God required a blood sacrifice. And so the fulfillment of the sacrifice was God in the flesh. How could that be possible? God manifested him in the flesh, and now he could fulfill the purpose of our atonement. He, now being, he could die. Second, he can now be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Remember, he's a spirit, so now he's dwelling within, uh, around us, tabernacled, and now he can feel that what we go through, our feelings, our pains, our hurts. Third, he left us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. Yet, on the other hand, where'd my notes go? There we go, I'm getting ahead of myself. So now let's talk about this duality of nature. This duality of nature was plainly hinted in the Old Testament prediction. The Old Testament prophesied of God coming to earth. Prophecy sometimes represented the coming of, of the Messiah as a human. And sometimes prophecy spoke of the Messiah as being divine. So on the human side, prophecy in Genesis said he was to become, he was the woman's seed. He was going to be a prophet like unto Moses. We talked about that when we talked in, in Matthew. He was going to be the lineal descendant of David, through his mom, and he was be, be, uh, known as Jehovah's servant. Yet, on the other hand, on the deity, oh, and he was also going to be a man of sorrows. But on the other hand, he was the branch of the Lord, beautiful and glorious, described in Isaiah. And here's one we quote during Christmas, he was the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the father of all ages. I, I like it because he's eternal, right? God, God is forever. He is the prince of peace. And he is Jehovah. As Jehovah, he was come suddenly to his temple. Malachi talked about that. Um, they were expecting a Messiah. Boom. He came here, but not as the ruler, uh, as the king so to speak, as they wanted to rule, that delivered them from the Roman oppression. But as a spiritual leader, we'll talk about this as we go on, because he came as a spiritual leader, which the, in Judaism at that time, they were so far away from God. They weren't ready to receive Jesus as a spiritual leader. We're, we're going to talk about that. And he was the one to be born in Bethlehem and to be ruler in Israel. It was the one whose going forth had been from days of eternity. So basically, these are prophecies of Jesus coming, or God coming to earth. So how were these two different sets of prophecies harmonized? How did they come together? Because John 1.14 is the answer. The one born in Bethlehem was the divine and eternal word. The incarnation does not mean that God dwelt in a man, but rather God became man. He became what he was not previously, though he never ceased to be all that who he was, God. So the babe of Bethlehem was Emmanuel, and what is Emmanuel? God with us. So we, he, we talked a little bit last week about this. He was tabernacled. We made a little reference, uh, a, a reference about the, ta uh, the, uh, the tabernacle plan and this being the tent where uh, the holiest of holies dwelt, God's presence dwelt. And dwelt or tabernacled among us. So in other words, he pitched his tent, just like in the Old Testament, when they put the tent, God's presence was inside the tent. Now, tabernacle means dwelt. He dwelt his presence in a fleshly form for 33 and a half years. And here's a hidden reverence to the tabernacle of Israel in the wilderness. That tabernacle had a typical significance. Why? It foreshadowed as God incarnate. Almost everything about the tabernacle alluded to the word made flesh. When Jesus came to earth, we beheld the glory of God, his glory. We beheld his glory. And what does this mean? What is meant by we beheld his glory? We beheld his glory. It refers to the essential glory of the divine perfections. It's God showing himself to us. Because in, in the Old Testament, you couldn't go to God's presence unless you were called, unless you were the the priest, you die. So uh, the, the anointing of God is powerful. And, and this is amazes me because 
in the Old Testament, it was only the high priest who could go before God. And there were requirements he had. He had to wash, he had to be clean. There were sacrifices. So he wouldn't die before God. And what amazes me is that same presence that dwelt in the tabernacle dwells in us, but yet we're not consumed. And I think that in itself is a miracle, that God's holy divine presence would live in us, that we wouldn't die, but yet prepare us to take him in his presence when he calls us. I don't know, to me, that's just, I think about that, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's powerful, God. Now, Jesus, right now we're going to get into the forerunner. So we talked about the word God manifested in the flesh. Now let's continue on in John, uh, the forerunner. Who was the forerunner? So we're, uh, the forerunner is going to be questioned, who are you? Not the Christ. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? We're going to explain these. Are you, uh, explain to yourself, who are you? And he says, I'm the voice. Why do you baptize? These are the religious leaders questioning the forerunner. He's preparing the way for Jesus. John's witness concerning Jesus, the location of this conference, of this incident, John proclaims Jesus as God's lamb. And the purpose of John's baptism, and then John tells of the spirit descending at Jesus. This is interesting. Um, we'll get into this. The spirit descending on Jesus at baptism, it foretells Jesus shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. So within a book of John, there's no mention of John's clothing consisting of camel's hair and that he had a leather girdle about his loins or that his meat was locust or wild honey. Nothing is recorded of his call to repentance, like in Matthew, nor is anything said of his announcement that a kingdom of heaven is at hand. Rather, John points to Jesus as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's talking about his deity. So without doubt, John, in several respects, is one of the most remarkable characters in the Bible because he was the subject of Old Testament prophecy. He was spoken of in Isaiah, said the forerunner will come. His birth was due to the direct and miraculous intervention of God. Why? Because his parents were beyond age to have children. It was a, remember, God's no respecter of age. He was filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. He was a man sent from God. And he was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. He was known as the forerunner or the messenger, to, or the voice that says, hey, the Lord is coming. So of him, the Lord said, among them, thou art born of women, and there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So here we go. This is interesting. So here we have a man who's the forerunner, ordained of God, preparing the way. And during an incident in one of the baptisms, the religious leaders send a, a group of people to inquire, who is this guy? So our passage opens by telling of a deputation of priests and Levites being sent from Jerusalem to inquire of John as to who he was. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? Nothing like this is found in any of the other Gospels, but it's a striking accord with the character and the scope of this fourth Gospel, which deals with, and listen, it's a spiritual rather than dispensational relationship. So John is talking about the deity of Jesus throughout the whole book, and it's about spiritual relationship instead of dispensational. So the incident before us brings out the spiritual ignorance you hear this, the spiritual ignorance of the religious leaders among the Jews. How is that? So they send it to John, and they ask, are you the Christ? They're curious. And, and he confessed, and he denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. These words give plain warning of the spirit in which the priest and the Levites had as they approached John and the design of the Jews who had sent them. So they had, uh, they, were, they were kind of malicious in their... They, they weren't exactly innocent in their, we study this out. Um, to them, the baptizer was an intruder. He was outside the religious systems of that day. Why? John had not been trained in the schools of the rabbis. He, had, he held no position of honor in the temple administrations. He was not identified with either the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the Herodians. So, 
what does he, re- uh, so the question is, where do you receive your authority? You're baptizing. You know, who, who sent you? Who, who authorized you to do this? Who had commissioned him to go forth bidding men to repent? By what right did he have baptizing people? Now that the multitudes were flocking to him, many had become his disciples. And this is what upset the religious leaders. So they asked him another question. Are you Elijah? And they asked him, What then, art thou Elijah? And he saith, I am not. He's being honest. Why should they have asked John if he were Elijah? Well, the answer is, and I found this was interesting, there there is a general expectation at that time among the Jews that Elijah would soon appear back on earth. So they were curious. So John went before Jesus in the spirit and the power of Elijah. We found that in Luke um, earlier. He came to make ready a people, why? Prepared for the Lord. So they didn't satisfy, so they could continue. Are you that prophet? This is interesting. They say, are you that prophet? What prophet? The prophet predicted through Moses. The prediction is recorded back in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18. It says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee. And I will put my words in their, his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So this verse was many of, uh, one of many messianic prophecies given in the Old Testament uh, received fulfillment in the person of the Lord Jesus. So they continue on. They're not satisfied. Then who are you? Then said they unto him, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest it? What do you say of yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Here was John's answer. What saith of thyself? And he says, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. So what is this voice in the wilderness? What a position for the Messiah's forerunner to occupy. Surely, his place should have been in Jerusalem. So why then, this is interesting, why then did not John cry in the temples if he was going to prepare the way for the Lord? Why? Because Jehovah was no more in the temples. You see, Judaism was but a hollow shell. Spiritually, there was no life within. It was a nation of legalists, Pharisee-ridden, who neither manifested Abraham's faith nor produced God's works. God would not allow his, the self-righteous formulism of the Jews to manifest the, the coming Messiah. Therefore, the one sent of God appeared outside the religious systems of the circles of that day. But why did John preach in the wilderness? Because the wilderness symbolized the spiritual barrenness of the Jewish nation. So then he asks, why do you baptize? And they which were sin of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, why baptize thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, and neither the prophet? This final question put to John by the embassy of Jerusalem confirms what we said previously in verse 20. The religious leaders among the Jews were disputing John's right to officially preach. You have, you, we, we, you're, not, you're not ordained of us. We didn't give you authority. Their mindset. And John is challenging his authority to ba- or their authority to baptize. John had received no commission from the Sanhedrin. John does not appear to have answered the last question directly, but instead he turns them and speaks of Jesus. So he's changing their direction here. And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. So John continued to stand his ground. He would not deny that he baptized with water, or more correctly, in water. But he sought to get them occupied with something of greater importance than a symbolical ritual or a symbolical rite. 
He's pointing to them. Hmm. There standeth one among you whom you not know. It is he who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet, and this is a very humble, when we talk about the shoes and the cleaning and the washing, we, we talked about that, the washing of the feet, how humble that was. Uh, that, that's another lesson. Um, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in uh, Bethabara beyond Jordan, uh, where uh, John was baptizing. So you got Israel, river, you got Jordan. So he was on the Jordanian side of the river, basically. Where am I? So now we have the introduction of Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So the behold the Lamb of God, this statement is deeply significant when viewed in the light of its setting. The Pharisees were looking for a prophet. They desired a king who should deliver them from the Roman yoke or young, uh, the bondage of uh, the power of Rome. They had no desire for a savior priest. See, their, their mindset wasn't right spiritually. It was under these circumstances that John announced Jesus as the Lamb of God and not as the Word of God. It was the Spirit of God presenting the Lord Jesus to Israel in the very office and character in which they stood in deepest need of him. They would have welcomed him on the throne, but they must first accept him on the altar. Spiritually, they weren't ready for that. Now we talk about, uh, this is interesting, uh, the, the spirit of God descends like a dove. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode, or rested upon him. This reference is when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, and the spirit descended upon him as a dove. So it manifested the character of the one on whom he came. The dove is the bird of love and sorrow, an appropriate of Jesus Christ. Why? The love expressed the sorrow, and the sorrow told, uh, the sorrow told um, of the depths of his love. We're talking about his willingness to die for us at Calvary, his love for his people. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and here's the key. The other scriptures don't say this word. The, the, the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. So you, you see these pictures in Sunday school, John baptizing Jesus, and you see this bird flying overhead. You know, that's, that's not exactly what happened here. Um, and no, no disrespect to Sunday school teachers, but it, it's... There's a, there's a point here. The word remaining is rendered to abiding. So this is one of the characteristic words found in John's gospel. The first three gospels don't make, uh, make no mention of Jesus being anointed by the Holy Spirit. But John is the only one that says the Spirit abode or abide or, or, was, dwelt in or was in him. Abiding in me. This term has to do with the divine side of things and speaks of fellowship. We have the same word again later and we'll go over in John 14. When, when Jesus says, Believeth thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I, that I say unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father abides in me. He doeth the works. So in John 15, where Jesus speaks of the fundamental requirements of spiritual fruit bearing, that's talking about fellowship with Jesus and, and among one another, he says, he that abideth or dwelleth in me and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. That Jesus shall baptize with or in the Holy Ghost was another proof of his Godhead. So let's look at the deity, a proof of his deity. Uh, or I'm sorry, about John, the witness of John. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So he, uh, here the witness of John ends. 
John has presented a sevenfold witness of Jesus. Now John, he did what he was supposed to do. And his witness of Jesus consists of, he testified to the preexistence that Jesus was before me. He testified to Jesus' lordship. He testified to Jesus' immeasurable superiority. I am not worthy of Don Luce's shoes. There's shoes, latchets. He testified to the sacrificial work, behold the lamb. He knew that God would come for as an atonement in the flesh. He testified to Jesus' moral perfections. I saw the Spirit descending upon him like a dove and abode upon him. He testified to Jesus' divine right to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he testified to his divine sonship. Uh, uh, talking about fellowship with us. Uh, being filled with God's Spirit and his fellowship with one another. So now Jesus' ministry is going to begin. So we had the introduction, the Spirit of God had a thought. He manifested that thought through his word. His word became flesh. He was born. He was raised. He was introduced by John the Baptist and now his cousin. And now Jesus is introduced to start his ministry. So before he started his ministry, he needed ministers or people to work with him. And for those that are taking notes that I'm going too fast, I <laughs> it was brought to my attention. Um, what, what I'd like to do is at the end here, uh, not well, the end of the lesson, um, I could just print out all these notes because it's in lesson form and I could just hand them out to everybody instead of taking notes. It'd make it so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot. <laughs> so now we're going to go to John points to Jesus as the Lamb of God, the eff uh, effect of this on two of his disciples. Now the disciples are being introduced. Jesus' searching question, the disciples' reply in communion with Jesus, the effects on Andrew. Jesus finds and calls uh, Philip to follow him, the effects this had on Philip, the meeting between Jesus and Nathaniel. So Jesus' first contact with his disciples. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Gal Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, who also were in the ship mending nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him, and went after he followed Jesus. So Jesus had a call. Why would they do this? Why would they just leave their profession? Well, we'll talk about this. Let's talk about John and Mark. Many have wondered how to harmonize John chapter 1 and Mark chapter 1, but, but there's, no, uh, there, there's nothing to harmonize because there's no contradiction between these two uh, books here. See, Mark and John are not writing on the same subject. Mark, and also Matthew and Luke, they deal with Jesus as a call to service, a service which concerned the lost house or the lost sheep of the house of Israel. John omits the call to service and focuses on, once again, spiritual relationships with people. Finding the Savior. It's interesting, uh, it's interesting the manner which these disciples, how they found Jesus. And, and, and uh, this might be one of these things I need to cut out in my <laughs> lesson to make it shorter. But I, I wanted to point that. I think this is interesting because not all of us came to God the same way, correct? Yeah. Uh, they did not all come to uh, Jesus the same way. The first two heard a preacher proclaiming Jesus as the Lamb of God. And in consequence, they promptly sought out Jesus for themselves. So a preacher spoke. Simon Peter was brought by Jesus, uh, brought to Je by his brother who had followed and found Jesus the previous day. Philip was specifically called by Jesus. Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip, Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Nathanael was sought out by his now converted brother Philip and was warmly invited to come to see Jesus for himself. So we see that God deals with humanity, some by a preacher, uh, some, hey, there's a difference in your life. You know, what, what, what's going on with you? You're doing, doing the same things. So you know, 
That's like a magnet that attracts people. They're curious. Uh, Jesus calls some specifically in the spirit, in their heart. Hey, Jesus called me. Um, some are converted, family members, friends, and they are a witness. So observe the subtlety of Jesus, how he took to himself men of such wildly, wildly different types of temperaments. How radically different then were these men. Each of them found Jesus, that which met his spiritual need and satisfies the heart. So let's go on a mission. Again, hmm. here we go. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, so these disciples were with John, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. What was the purpose of John's mission? What results grew from John's ministry? See, Jesus had borne faithful wit or John had borne faithful witnesses to Jesus. How had his ministry been received? In the first place, the religious leaders of his day rejected the testimony of God. We find that in Luke chapter 7. The second place, great crowds were attracted to Jesus, and men of all sorts attended the ministry. Also found in Luke. But in the third place, only a few were really affected by the message. And they stood ready to receive the Messiah when he appeared. It's sad. So once more, John heralds Jesus as the Lamb of God. This teaches us that there are times when the servants of God needs to re, uh, repeat the same message. Because sometimes you talk to people and they, they don't get it. So you got to, sometimes you just got to keep witnessing and witnessing until the word gets in their heart. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And the two disciples of John, they, they heard him speak. These two men were James and Andrew. By calling, they were fishermen. They had already attached themselves to John and had not only been baptized, but were eagerly awaiting the promised Messiah, the Savior. They found him, and now they follow Jesus. So Jesus, they, they, they follow Jesus, and he turns around and says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said, what seek you? What, what are you seeking? Why are you following me? No sincere soul seeks to follow Jesus in vain. At the first sight, this question seems uh, kind of strange to us. But the question was designed to test the motive of these men, to help them understand their own purpose. See, during this time, many followed Jesus because the crowd streamed after him and carried him, them along with it. See, and, and th this is interesting. Oh, okay, here it goes. Many followed Jesus for what they could get, the loaves of fish, the curing of their ailments, the healings of their loved ones. For a time, many followed him because it was the popular and respectable thing to do. Like in the 80s, <laughs> those of us are still young, you know, the big sweat that came through, uh, the, uh, especially L.A., the, the, the Catholic Church was the, uh, um, the charismatic movement. And there was a big split with the, <laughs> the, uh, the bishop, <laughs> You know, a lot of charismatic movement came to Northern California, and there was a big move of the, the Mario Murillo and all that ministry. And it was a popular thing to do at that time, the charismatic, woo, and the healings and stuff, and name it and blame it and blab, blab it, grab it, you know. It was popular, you know, but it faded. But a few followed Jesus because they felt their deep need of him and were attracted by the perfections of who he was, his person. So then they asked, they asked Jesus, where, where do you dwell? Where, where are you staying? So notice the reply made by these two men. Master, they said, where dwellest thou? There is no question uh, of, of, of idle curiosity. See, it showed that they longed to be with Jesus. They came and saw where he dwelled and abode with him that day, for it was about the uh, 10th hour, it's about 4 p.m. So fully had he won their confidence so completely he had attracted their hearts to himself. The first day of meeting Jesus, the words abode speaks of spiritual fellowship. And one of the two which heard uh, John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon and says unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. He's excited. This long-awaited prophecy, the Messiah is here. They found him. Come on, come, come and look for yourself. They were encouraging 
So what does he do? This tells of the satisfaction of these two disciples that they had in Jesus. Why? They wished uh, to share their uh, newborn joy to other people. Guess what we have? This is a happy privilege of every young believer to tell others about Jesus. It illustrates the fact that our personal responsibility begins with those nearest to us. Witness should be displayed first in our own family circles, our friends, our coworkers. And a promise is made to Simon. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, or perhaps better, the son of John. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And I find this is really interesting. So here we find the Lord giving Simon a blessed promise. Cephas was Aramaic. It signifies a rock. And when the one that we use a lot is Petros. This is the Greek version. The Greek word, it signifies a stone. Jesus said, thou art Simon. That's his natural name. It means vacillating and unstable. But now Jesus gives him a new name. Thou shalt be called Cephas, his new name, meaning a rock, now fixed and stable. So here was the pastor talks about this. His unstable, his, he would be what we call in law enforcement a strong type A personality. Very there, there's some people that are st st strong type pers A personalities that they, their, their mind is set, they have a vision, and their goal is this. And it's like a bull in a china closet. Boom. Y y some people don't understand that personality. If you don't get it, you're going to be highly offended. And that's not how people with that personality are. It's just their mind, goal driven. Boom. You just go with it. And this was uh, Peter. He was just, but the Bible talked about he also you know, he had bad language. He was very, uh, when you study him, he had a high temper. Um, so God's taken this humanity and, and molded him into what God wanted to use. His, his, so see, see that, that's interesting because you might look at the, like, oh man, I've, I've seen some people in the past, I'm like, how in the world could God use that person knowing their past? But God takes those characteristics and molds it and uses those strengths to be a leader for him and uses that. And, and that's why you can't judge people. You know, God, God knows the heart. So now Jesus is seeking Philip. Philip. So the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. So what a pleasant illustration of his own declaration. The son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That reference is in Luke. This shows us Jesus as the good shepherd going after this one lone sh sheep. Uh, hey, Andrew, Brother Andrew, what tile am I on? Thank you. I don't know what I did. Yeah, there's a gun. Thank God I labeled these. There we go. We see it is Jesus himself who seeks out and finds each one, who then becomes his followers. Je Jesus makes the call, we, we respond. Our seeking of him is only the reflex action of his first seeking us, just as we love him because he first loved us. Now, Philip was of, we say Bethesda, but it's Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter, finding Philip, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Here's an excitement. And here again, we see the effect that Jesus' revelation of himself has on a newly born soul. The young believer partakes of the spirit of the one in whom he has believed. The compassion of Jesus for the lost now fills his heart. So I don't want to keep this in my own mind. I want to share. I want to share this good news that I have. But sometimes we run into people and they have doubts as with Nathaniel. It's humanity. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? He was honest. And here, the one who seeks to win souls must expect to be met with objections. Because people don't understand. All that Philip said to Nathaniel in reply to his question was, Come and see. He invited his brother to come and to put Jesus to the test for himself. 
This is, uh, this is uh, the wise way. Do not be turned aside by the objections of the one whom you're speaking to, but continue to press upon this person the claims of Jesus. In other words, what God has done in your life, share your testimony, and, and uh, that God will trust and bless your words and affects the, the heart or the soul of the person you're talking to. And leave it at that. Jesus saw Nathanael come unto him and saith unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Nathanael was an honest and open. His question to Philip was not evasion, but rather it was the voice of genuine difficulty. He didn't understand. This must not be forgotten in our dealings as we deal with different souls. See, we, mu we must not conclude that all questions put to us are asked as, as a critical spirit. There are some people who have real difficulties. What they need is a spiritual truth, and to obtain this, that they need to come to Jesus. You see, Nathaniel was an Israelite indeed in whom there was no deceitfulness in his heart. One of the qualifications for becoming a good hearer to receive God's word is having an honest and a good heart. Be willing to receive the word when it's taught to you and not reject it. Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence then do you, where, how do you know me? Jesus said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Wow. This incident, it proves two things. The evidence of the deity of Jesus, it displayed his omniscience. In other words, he's in all places at all times. So the spirit inside the flesh said, I saw you. That, that was the spirit of God. Uh, that's his omniscience. Is is a, that's one of the three things. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and all places at all, present in all places at all times. So remember, Jesus is not just man. He was the God-man. Jesus saw Nathanael and read his heart before he came to him. And Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And this was sure evidence that the divine work had been wrought in Nathanael's soul. The eyes of his understanding were open. Why? To behold the divine glory of his Savior. And last. Actually, one more. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So, the, we, this, the, here in the last year we have what's known as three distinct dispensations. So, in the last half of John, remember we talked, the first half was, was the, um, the Word made flesh. The last half of John, we have what's called three distinct dispensations. The first is found in John 1, 19-28. This is a dispensation. This pictures the Old Testament dispensation. The second begins in John 1, the next day, and ends in John 1, 34. It's a picture of the messianic dispensation, embracing the period of Jesus' public ministry on the earth. And the last dispensation, uh, again, the next day, it starts in John 30, 1, 35, ends in 42, and it is a picture of the Christian dispensation. So this concludes our lesson in chapter one, perfect timing, and uh, we'll start next week with chapter two, and I will try to cut down a lot of this information. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming back to this uh, service with Brother Bryant. So but let's pray before we go. Lord, I thank you, God, for this, this morning's service. I thank you for this lesson. And I pray somehow something in this uh, word, the study, God, will get into our hearts. And as we go out, Lord, and, and eat the food to refresh our bodies, I pray we'll come back ready in our minds and our souls and our spirits to lift your name up, to praise and worship you, God, as you move in this service today and do a mighty work. It's your anointing upon the ministry and the preaching of the man of God and upon the music, Lord. I pray and anticipate, God, good things, God, for your people. We worship you and we come back. And in the name of Jesus, we praise you, God. Amen.